where are we? Here's where we are. Um, where we are is that we know how to take a bunch of derivatives and we know that you take the derivative of a sum you get the sum of the derivatives we know that when you multiply a function by a constant you get uh, the <clears throat> then you take the derivative you get the derivative times the constant we know that if you take the derivative of a power of x, a constant power of x, you get one one fewer power and you multiply by the exponents and we know that the derivative of e to the x is itself. And today I promise to prove uh, the product rule. So, this is going to be, I mean, I'm going to like the algebra is kind of tough, <clears throat> but we're, we're brave and strong um, and fearless, so we're going to just power through it. It's going to be great. So, I have two functions, um, and I want to take the derivative of the product. So the derivative is every day the derivative is the same thing. It's the limit that you get evaluating your function at x plus h um, then subtracting your function evaluated at x and then divided by h. If it doesn't look like zero divided by zero, you probably wrote it wrong. And now the thing is, I have no clue how to simplify this. I just have, I just have no idea because uh, I see a lot of products in the numerator, I would go let me let me take a common factor, but there's no common factors um, anywhere. I could go try to multiply by something in the numerator and denominator to make it simpler. But that's just that's not going to make it simpler. It's just going to make it more complicated. Um, this doesn't factor into anything. I can't split it into, I mean, I could split it into two fractions, but that's just going to make it infinity minus infinity, which is, I think, worse. So, what can I do? Well, uh, I'm going to do, uh, I would ask you, but this is, um, I mean, you can tell me what to do really fast, but I'm going to be incredibly impressed if you know. <clears throat> this is not the kind of thing that you just guess. So, um, you go, I have no common factors, uh, but I would like some. I would like to somehow, well, kind of um, a hint is that I know what I'm supposed to get. I know somehow I need to have f of x plus h minus f of x multiplied by g of x. And I don't have that, so how about I, how about I put it in myself? Um, so I don't have common factors, how about I make some for myself? Um, how about I, um, Oh. 
what if I just add this thing and then subtract it? <clears throat> so that's what I'm going to do, and it's going to work. So now uh, the thing the thing is, it was a great idea that I just had. I'm kidding. I didn't have this idea to um, to add to add and subtract the thing. By the way, adding and subtracting the same thing is definitely something I can do because that's just adding zero. Um, because now there's a common factor here, and there's a common factor here. So if I can combine these, I can combine these two, and I'm going to get a lot of a very reasonable thing. So first, I'm going to take this on and reorder it. So this sum is f of x plus h g of x plus x plus h minus f of x g of x plus h. So these two factors Maybe it should still be blue. Have a common factor of g of x plus h. This is so convenient. Um, and, and now there's um, the remaining two factors. That have a common factor of f of x. So exciting. So, um, so I said, I mean, I promised myself some common factors. That that line I can see in the tablet, but not in the screen. That's just great. to me. Okay. Um, so I promised myself common factors. So I better do something with them. Like pull them out. Like write f of x plus h. So this is starting to look promising because I have f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h and this is multiplied by g of x plus h. Um, and over here, I have a common factor of f of x times g of x plus h times g of x divided by h. So now things are starting to look incredible. They're starting to look fantastic. Um, so if these four, so there's four things here. Uh, so if I split the, the limit into a sum of limits, if they both exist, and then each sum into a product of limits, I'm going to end up with four limits, each of which, which I can I can compute. Uh, I make copy in here f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. No, that's not what I'm copying. No. Okay. F of x times the limit of g of x plus h minus g of x divided by h. Woo! So, 
I know some of these limits. Um, so, I know this limit exists, I mean, I guess I didn't say it explicitly, but this is only going to work if f and g are differentiable. So, um, so what is this limit? So I'm asking right now to you this question, what is this limit? Then I'm going to ask you, no, actually, I'm going to ask you, first of all, I'm going to go from easy to hard. What is this limit? Then what is this limit? Then what is this limit? And finally, what is this limit? So, um, what is limit number one? F of X. F of X, thank you very much. I. I missed who's, whose name lit up, but you're an unsung hero. That limit is f of x. Uh, that's the limit of a constant function of h. Um, there's no h anywhere. If your function returns f of x all the time, what happens when h approaches 0? It's still going to be returning f of x. So what is, um, okay, so the final answer is something times something plus f of x times so what is this limit what is limit number two what happened i was would it be zero? Zero. If you plug in uh, zero for h, it's g of x minus g of x, which is zero over h. This is a minus. Uh, so this would be zero divided by zero because the okay. denominator is zero as well. And zero divided by zero is nothing. Um, and if you see a limit that is zero divided by zero, you have no reason to think that the limit is zero. Would it just be undefined? Well, that would that would mean that the, that would mean that this doesn't work. So I hope it's not undefined. The fact that it's zero divided by zero doesn't mean that the limit does not exist. Maybe I'm going to ask you, what about three? What is the limit as h approaches zero of f of x plus h? minus f of x divided by h. I mean, you know nothing about f. It's not like you're going to tell me an answer like, it, the answer is not going to be 2. The answer is going to be something about f. The only thing you know about f is that it's differentiable. A possible hint is that I've already told you what the end of this computation is. I've already told you what the product law is. I guess then the inverse, not inverse, the derivative of f. That's what I guess too. That That is, um, this is the limit I have been writing um, every day for a week now. This limit is the derivative of f um, at x. How do I know this limit exists? Because I've been told that the derivative exists. OK. So 
the front. So notice how this is starting to look, so how my final answer is starting to look like the answer I promised. Uh, so what is limit number two then? If the limit of f of x plus h minus f of x divided by x is f prime of x, what's the limit of g of x plus h minus g of a x divided by h? g prime of x. Thank you, Sam. Um, yeah, it's exactly the same thing, except with a different letter. And which letter you're using doesn't matter at all. Um, OK. So, three out of four. So, what is the the last one? A G of X. It is G of X. Um, and why is it G of X? Because you plug in zero, and then it gets a, like a constant again. And why can I find a limit? Uh, by plugging in zero. You're right, but, but why? What is a function that I can, where I can find the limit by plugging in. I hope by now everyone agrees with me that not every function, not every time you can find limits by plugging in, because if that were the case, we wouldn't call them limits, we would call them plugging ins. Why is there a black square? Um, direct substitution. Direct substitution doesn't work always. Otherwise, they wouldn't be called limits, they would be called direct substitutions. Um, for which functions does it work? A direct substitution works for um, rational numbers and polynomials, right? Um, um, rational functions, you mean? Uh, yeah. So it works for rational functions and polynomials. I wasn't told f could be one of those, uh, but it might, uh, sorry, g could be one of those, but it could also not be. It could be the exponential function which is not a polynomial or a rational function. The reason it works for those is that those functions are continuous. So how do, how do I know now that G is continuous? Nobody told me that G was continuous. Uh, I was told that G was differentiable. Uh, but the thing is, if you remember, I think Monday's Monday's class. Monday's class, we saw that every differentiable function is continuous. Um, at x and differentiable functions are continuous. And now that's it. And now I know, um, unless what I wrote is not in the screen. It is. Um, so now I'm uh, now I'm finished. The, this limit, indeed, I can find by plugging in. But it's better if I know why I could just do that. I guess I could try to use the plugin every time, every time, and then sometimes it works, sometimes it don't. It doesn't. But I mean, who cares if like you're designing cars and some of them explode, no, some of them don't. All right, so um, so that's um, that's why the product rule works. So 
Um, feel free to ask me any questions. Um, if your question is, how did you come up with, uh, with that blue thing that you added and subtracted out of nowhere? The answer is, well, the answer is it didn't come out of nowhere. Um, is it that I'm very smart? Uh, not at all. Um, it's that someone told me when I learned, when I first learned this, they told me, this is how you do this. And now I know, and it didn't take a lot of smartitude to, for me to just remember to add and subtract the thing. Uh, and why did my high school teacher um, or my college teacher uh, know to add and subtract this thing because they learned it. So the thing is, this was the invention of adding and subtracting a thing, which is a very smart thing, was that it's something I assume Leibniz came up with uh, 200 years ago. And you only need one person in history to have this great idea. And now we can just copy him. So it's not like anyone is asking me or you to have the wonderful idea to add and subtract this thing to make this formula work. Um, I'm not, but if I, you know, if I gave you now a very similar problem, now I wouldn't expect you to come up with a fantastic idea by yourself. I would, I would think you've seen the idea and now you're not coming up with it. Um, are there any questions? I mean, I'm, it's very suspicious that there are, if there aren't. Uh, that Why does, um, so every single, when do you just like multiple, how did you like, You know, never, never mind. I'll... What? How did I want? I have a question. Too. Aaron, yeah. Uh, so is there like a certain case where you have to plug in the, the stuff in the blue or whatever? Um, a certain case? Well, basically, I mean, here, it was kind of a special I guess the, the case was that I had, basically I, I had this, um, looking at this made me think I can, I can write this as, uh, I can, I, I can factor this, write this as a sum of things that I can factor out. Um, that's the only thing that's special about it. Um, so I have, you know, a product of two things minus a product of two other things. Um, could, would you be able, does it matter if you use, um, F of X or G of X when you're doing the subtraction thing at the beginning? No, uh, if I had gone, if instead of subtracting and adding F, F of X times G of X plus H, if I had gone with, um, adding F of X plus H G of X, that would have worked as well. Uh, that would have been very, very similar. That's a good question. So, um, I guess I think the the best way I could have guessed what I needed to what I needed to do here would have been if I was told, which I was, I, I guess yesterday based on drawing a rectangle, what the answer was. I could go from here. I could go back. I could go from here to here. Um, I wouldn't have guessed, I wouldn't have guessed this, uh, but I would have guessed, um, this and this. So I would have known a very similar thing that I was supposed to write here. And then I could have thought, how do I, how do I get from this equation to this one? And I could have guessed, you know, this one has four terms. So let's add, add two things here to make it, to make them match. Uh, would have been impressive if I had done that or if you did that by yourselves, but um, could have worked. 
I, I believe. Um, starting a problem from the end is a pretty useful strategy. It works a lot of the time. <laughs> Especially if the final thing, the, yeah, you believe you can simplify and the starting thing you don't. Like in this case, I don't think I can, the thing I started with, I had no idea how to simplify it without adding more stuff to it. But adding more stuff is not really simplifying. Any more questions? Well, the good news is that we don't need to prove this. We only need to prove this once in our life. And now we can just use it. So, um, so now, well, I can take the derivative of any product of functions as derivative I know. I don't know that many derivatives yet, so not that many examples I can do. But for example, so um, so I can take the derivative of a product like this, and now you can do this two different ways. So. Uh, one way is to use the product rule because this is a product and deciding how to do a derivative is, is as hard and as easy as deciding which kind of function you're looking at. I look at this function and I go, it's a product, all right? So uh, it's the derivative of one of them times the other. Uh, plus the one times the derivative of the other. And now I need to take the derivative of these two polynomials, which, um, which I, which is pretty easy, it requires basically no thinking derivative of x squared by the, so it's a polynomial. That's when you can use the power rule. Um, basically, that's it. The base is x. The exponents are uh, constants. I'm good to go. Uh, so the derivative of x squared is 2x to the 1. Derivative of x, x is x, is x to the 1. The derivative of x is 1x to the 0, which is 1. Derivative of x is 1. And the three just comes out and the derivative of a constant is zero. And this I'm supposed to not touch. Um, so basically the only way to mess this up is to decide to take both derivatives and multiply them. And here derivative of X is one derivative of a constant is zero. And that's the answer. And uh, I could multiply it out and add it, but I also could not, like, I have, right now, I have no reason to do that. But if I was asking you to take the derivative and you gave me this answer without simplifying, I would be fine because um, I don't care. If you had to do something with it, I would then if, if I wanted to do something with this function afterwards, I would simplify it to make my life easier. But I'm not going to. <clears throat> um, what is the derivative of... Um, are there any questions before we start this one? Oh, what? No. I have a question. What's the other way to do this? derivative that we know right now. Oh no, we don't know. 
what can you do with this function? Factor. You mean unfactor, this factor. Uh, it's already factored. Unless you mean factor. Oh, factor the first thing? Yeah, the second thing is already, you, you can't factor it further. And, uh, I mean, you could, uh, okay. So I guess, okay, Matthew, that's, uh, that's not the answer I was thinking, but I guess you're right. What is the, what is the quadratic formula say for this equation? Three plus minus, minus nine minus four. The fact that I didn't give you one that factors nicely probably means that's not the answer I was thinking. So you could go like this, I guess. Um, and, and then take the derivative, use the product rule twice. That is, um, I don't recommend doing this. Seems um, just harder. Um, uh, one thing you could do is go the other way and instead of factor multiply um, you know how this goes where you um, where you go there's there's three things and then two things so foil doesn't work and then your head explodes because you were you were lied to with this foil thing which I believe is just I think foil just exists to confuse you because it, it makes you it makes you never again know um, what the distributive law is. The distributive law says that to multiply these things, I'm supposed to multiply every sum in, in one factor by every sum in the other factor and um, add them together. So that's going to be everything times x. Or you could come with another acron acronym for for this that has six letters and only consonants, hopefully. So that's the x times everything, and that is um, two times everything, and then, well, together, added together, that's the function. That's the same function. And now we can just take the derivative of that, um, and you should get the same answer. And these two might be equally complicated. I don't know if I prefer one over the other. Did that make sense? Hope it did. Uh, I have a question about the first method. Yeah. So when we use the power rule, do we only use it um, in front of the after the d over dx well the power rule is we use that for taking derivatives so yeah only if, if there's a derivative to take right so do you mean you mean for example here why i didn't use it and here yeah right uh, yeah exactly <clears throat> I use the power rule to take a derivative. And if I don't have to take a derivative, I don't use the power rule. So I'm supposed to take the derivative of whichever is in, whatever is in front of DDX. That's DDX means you have to take the derivative here, Moises. Um, so I have to take the derivative of this and that, and that's what I use the power rule for. And if I don't have to take the derivative, I just leave it alone. I, I gotta do, the least amount of work possible. Yeah. All right. So here's an example that only only works, uh, only has one way of solving it. At least that I can think of. X minus one times e to the x. So, all right, no, I guess it has to. I guess I could multiply this out and take the derivative, but that wouldn't get me very far. Um, 
so this is again this function is a product um so what i'm supposed to do is take one derivative times the other and be careful with what uh, if you don't use brackets it might not be clear what you're supposed to take the derivative of and then another derivative of the other so um derivatives of polynomials you're going to do in your head very fast derivative of x is one derivative of a constant is zero so that is one times e to the x and here i have x minus one times the derivative of e to the x which is which is e to the x Oof. i thought i was going to suffocate there thank you matthew so um so this is the answer i got and i feel like i feel like simplifying this one because there's an e to the x everywhere and here there's a one plus x minus one so the first one is e to the x times one, of course. Everything is itself times one. Uh, so that's where I get this one. And this is e to the x times x. Thank you, Sam. Um, okay, uh, last one. So this one, you will never do it using the product rule, but now we only have the product rule, so we're gonna have to do it this way. Um, so, um, I'm going to let you think why this is a product for 10 seconds. Well, I close the blind so I don't have the sun in my face. <laughs> Have you figured it out yet? Of course you did, but you just don't want to tell me because you want me to learn by myself. Well done. So um, the way I can write this as a product is by what if I think of x as x plus x, because I know that if I have an exponent, uh, which is a sum, uh, a, a product of exponentials of the same base, is the same as an exponential whose exponent is the sum. So this derivative is um, the derivative of the product of e to the x by itself. Um, and now I can use the product rule. So the product rule says, take the derivative of e to the x and multiply by e to the x, and then add e to the x. And multiply it by the derivative of e to the x. Um, and now every time I see the derivative of e to the x, I get e to the x. Um, and now I can, I, I'm going to simplify this because it looks like I, it looks like I am not well. Um, e to the x times e to the x is Well, is is I'm doing what I did before. This is e to the two um, x. If you like, is e to the x squared. And there you use the other exponent uh, rule. So I have e to the two x plus itself, and that's going to be two e to the two x. And notice that I didn't apply the power rule, and I didn't get the answer that the power rule says I should get, and that's because. Um, well, that's because this is an exponential of base that is not x and exponent, which is not constant. Um, uh, 
All right. Um, so, if there's no questions, um, I'm going to move on to the quotient rule. So, I'm going to leave the proving it for um, next week when we're all the wiser. So, the quotient rule, you guessed it, tells me how to find the derivative of a quotient. And it's kind of nasty. Um, but we will. We love her for who she is. You take a fraction, a quotient of two, of two functions, which are differentiable. So if f and g are differentiable and g of x is not zero. Because otherwise, how am I going to divide this? So if this happens, then the formula, you would never guess what comes now. Um, the formula for the, the derivative of the quotient uh, is this thing. The good news is you're going to use it enough that you're going to memorize it. So um, the, the, the denominator is g squared. And the way people, so it's kind of like the product rule, but there's a minus sign. So it's hard to, it's hard to remember which, is, which has a plus and which has a minus. Um, the thing English speakers say to remember this is low d high minus high d low. And this has a ring to it, which makes people remember. <clears throat> I don't know if they think of Heidi when they, I don't know if they remember the cartoon Heidi when they say this, but this is what people say, this is what people Say every time out loud when they do a derivative of a quotient. So now you're in on the secret. Okay, so I'm gonna prove it when when I can do it. I could prove it the same way we did the product rule, pretty much. Right, write out the limit and power through it. Except now there's gonna be nasty fractions. But we could totally do it. But I'm gonna spare you that and do it later a, a bit easier. Um. So let's do let's do look at how to use this. Um, so very easy derivative. The easiest I can think of. The derivative of one over x. So here, so here f is one and g is x. If I think of this as f over g. So low d high minus high, ugh, I have to say high d low divided by the denominator squared is, well, all the g's are x's and all the f's are ones. So in this case, the derivative of one is zero and the derivative of x is one. So the derivative of one over x is negative one over x squared. Which I feel like we already knew. Are there any questions? Also, you can ask questions if I don't say, are there any questions? You know, in person, I would look at how many confused faces I see and know if I have to stop. But here, you better make a confused noise, or otherwise, I'm just going to keep going. Um, this is kind of a dumb question. But I just got a little bit um, lost when um, one of 
the Fs is zero and one of them is one, is it because of the, de like, of the derivative? Yeah, so when I write prime, so when I write prime here, that this means take the derivative. So this means the derivative of one. And that's the derivative of a constant, which is zero. And this means the derivative of x. So then I need to take those derivatives. For example, well, one is a constant. Its derivative is zero, so that's how I get zero. And x, I can use the power rule. The derivative of x to the one is one x to the zero, which is just one. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So Matthew asked in the chat if I could solve this last problem that I did here using the chain rule. Uh, so the answer is what is the chain rule? So the chain rule is what we're supposed to, what we're gonna see on Monday. Um, and you can definitely, when, once you know it, you can definitely, this will be the way you solve this problem. But uh, for now, I guess it's an example of the chain rule that you now know without knowing the chain rule. Um, okay, so we you knew this because this is a power, this is also um, the power law, the derivative of x inverse by the power law, the basis x, the exponent is constant, is x to the negative two, and that is negative one over x squared. A nice thing about derivatives, the derivative rules of math is that, um, they are consistent with each other. You can solve a, the same problem a lot of different ways. And you always get the same answer, even though sometimes it's not that clear that you got the same answer, but you did. Okay. Uh, okay. One more easy example, and then I'll, I'll do, I guess I'll, I'll leave the complicated example for tomorrow. So the quotient rule, sometimes does lead to, lead to nasty algebra, sadly, but what are you gonna do? Um, especially if I ask you to take a second derivative, <laughs> because you still get a fraction, you have to do the whole thing again. So the derivative of e to the x divided by x squared, um, well, the chain rule says the denominator is the square of the denominator um, and then the numerator is uh, low t high minus uh, high d low. So the ones with the prime are the ones I'm supposed to take the derivative of. The derivative of x squared uh, of e to the x, I, I hope I know by memory by now very easy rule to learn, it's just itself. And now the derivative of x squared, I can get by the power rule, it's 2x to the first power, which is just 2x. Um, we can simplify that, but we could also not, because nobody told us to. All right, are there any questions? If there's no questions, um, have a good day. I hope to see you in my office hours, which are today at 